AI companion. Uh, this is the governance call on Thursday, March 7th, 2024. Uh, Tom, AI, uh, Zoom has a couple of AI features they've enabled in the last couple of months. Uh, one of them is the AI companion, which is kind of a chat bot in the chat. So you can bring up the chat companion and it, notice it says, it gives you a couple hints, catch me up, what are the action items, et cetera. It's kind of looking at the transcript and trying to be smart about what Scott said. But in, in our experience so far, it lags the conversation by a bit. So if you if you try to if you try to ask it a question about something that happened in the last couple of minutes, it's not likely to be very smart. <laughs> but once it catches up, it's really pretty good. Then the AI summary is something I've been using on almost all my calls. And uh, after the call, I will get an email with a summary as if there had been a smart, better than high schooler sitting in our meeting taking notes. Funny. And it works well. It'll say like, you know, Tom and Jerry talked about uh, wise democracy and they decided, you know, Tom's going to send Jerry a, a, a follow-up or whatever, blah, 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 and, and on from there. It's, it's pretty interesting. Um, so now that we've turned everything on and we have a few more people who've joined us, people I haven't seen in a very long time. <laughs> we all just got off a call a half hour ago, many of us um the the standing ogm weekly call uh i was thinking hank if you wouldn't mind um reporting in on your iceland adventure uh, at the rethinking democracy event yeah let let me just give a, a short overview of it because uh it hasn't all been digested in my head and we still have to get together to make several documents from different perspectives. But essentially, it was about uh, rethinking democracy and how Nordic uh, countries might be able to rethink democracy in such a way that it could be a, an inspiration to the rest of the world. Uh, it was in Iceland, lasted three days, uh, altogether, there are about 60 people who attended. And one of the uh, very nice things about it is that for a change, uh, there were a lot of young people. Usually when I go to conferences, the people are all in their, well, maybe 40s, but 50s, 60s, etc. Uh, but there were a dozen uh, people, in at least a dozen people in their 20s. Uh, people came from all the five Nordic countries of Europe and uh, from other countries as well, as far away as uh, Nepal and uh, Uruguay. We had uh, delegates. And it, uh, it was a half day of short presentations, uh, including a presentation about how values determine uh, how we think and feel and relate to issues of democracy and thinking about short-term or middle-term or long-term futures. Uh, as a, uh, a lead-in to that, uh, we asked all the participants to fill out a values assessment survey in advance. And the, the Norwegian woman uh, who uh, is an expert on values and culture, sort of told us where we were and remarked on a few things that uh, were interesting to her and might be interesting to the group. And there was another uh, presentation, or actually two presentations, by the parliamentary futures committees, one of Finland and one of Iceland. And although they go by different names. It seems that there are about uh, a dozen or more countries that have parliamentary futures committees, which might be called different things. Uh, a lot of them have just started up. Finland's has been uh, running for, uh, I'd say, almost 20 years. And what role a parliamentary futures committee has on advising uh, the politicians, their colleagues in the parliament and the and the cabinet, uh, on what is good for that country's quality of life. 
and uh, all agreed that the quality of life in Northern Europe, the so-called Nordic model, uh, was very good. It was the, the one model where lots of people could point to back uh, at the end of the last century and the beginning of this one as successful social democracies. Uh, they're all being eroded by the same kind of forces that are eroding uh, democracies in America and India and the Netherlands and, and wherever. Uh, but uh, from their own, the, the research of the people who attended, uh, young people in those five countries do feel it's important to have a much more public uh, discourse about what democracy was, is, and could be. And one of the ambitions uh, of the people attending the conference was to see how that could be done at all levels of the society, uh, the, the normal, well-educated people uh, who might do that anyway, but also the more dissatisfied uh, uh, people with a lower education who jobs feel, who feel threatened by migration and, and uh, artificial intelligence, but also at the level of politicians, uh, not only at national, but also at regional, and especially at the city level. And uh, after, uh, uh, let's see if I'm counting in my head, five hours of uh, presentations, uh, we had a visit to uh, the Iceland uh, parliament. Uh, Iceland is the country with the longest uh, continuing parliament in the world. Our thing. Sorry? The yeah, Alf thing, uh, I think it's called. Yeah, ex exactly. Uh, and it started in the 10th century and at different locations before Reykjavik was anything, but places in the country, it has continued since the 10th century. And the Secretary General of the Parliament gave us a guided tour. We were met by the uh, Prime Minister of Iceland, and it sort of set the scene of how one Nordic country, Iceland, uh, has been involved with so-called or so-labeled democratic processes uh, for uh, many centuries. And the second day of the conference were full-day uh, uh, democracy labs, uh, one based on... Uh, uh, technology and artificial intelligence as a driver of change in society, uh, one based on uh, climate and climate change as a driver for change in society, and one based on uh, governance, uh, institutions, and paradigms as a driver for change in society. And they were at it uh, eight hours on the second day and the morning of the third day, and uh, things were reported in the plenary uh, at the end of the conference. And I can go into more detail about what happened, especially in my lab, because I was uh, co-facilitating uh, one of the labs, but perhaps I've told enough to to stimulate ideas or thinking uh, from other people. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Two things. Uh, is there a link for the conference? Because I, I don't remember what it was called. And if there's a link, I would love to add that. And then did the parliament offer any like successful explanation for why they failed to ratify their redesigned constitution? Uh, no, no. Because that's it, a shame. It, that's sort of a shameful yeah. thing that happened. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. Uh, but but uh, things like that were we let let put it a different way. Uh, we were very very interested in how uh, parliamentary committees for the future work and why they have in Finland been reasonably successful in influencing uh, legislation for. 20 years and what other countries could learn from that. So we didn't really get many questions about something as specific as that. Interesting. Interesting. Anybody else with uh, questions for Hank? Hank, what's your, I'm sorry, good. 
Go ahead, Tom. Did the Danes mention their consensus conference innovation that was operating, you know, 20 years ago, but I, I don't know if it's still operating. Uh, it wasn't brought up in the plenaries or in my lab, though it very well may have uh, come up in either of the other two labs. Um, if you put it in the chat, maybe we can Google it and see, uh, I have, see if I have it's still it online. Chat. Oh, excellent. Thanks. I think it's the Office of Technology or something like that. Has yeah. Innovated it. It's a major uh -huh. citizen engagement, public citizen engagement. Process. Sounds very good. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I will now put a link to uh, the conference in the chat. Hank, I'm interested in your personal assessment of, um, you know, what would you walk away with? What, you know, what was what gave you hope? What has you what has you concerned? You know, where do you think this is going? Just, you know, I'm not asking you to talk globally, but just from a personal point of view as a participant, what was it like? It was a little like, um, yeah, how can I describe it? It, it was a little hmm. like lots of people who are uh, passionate in diverse ways, uh, cognitively or emotionally, or uh, being in the same room with others like themselves, uh, uh, committed, yeah, shall I word, use the word, semi-committed to learning new things so they could take it away and do things. And that's a feeling that I don't re usually get at conferences or meetings. It's like, uh, well, I think A and all the other people think X, Y, Z. This was everyone's thinking X, Y, Z together. So it was a kind of, if I use the word, a kind of homecoming feeling uh -huh. for for yeah. uh, many people. Uh, I had two major takeaways. One was uh, that young people in many different countries are very concerned about public conversation about the futures that democracy might, uh, might take. And the other was a sort of process uh, uh, <coughs> learning since I was in the in the team of eight people who developed it, how we did everything wrong and how if we did another one, we'd uh, change lots of things and try to have uh, online streaming and uh, organize uh, online uh, conversational groups in, in 10 or 15 different countries around the world. So we sort of were finger, what's that in English? Uh, it was a sort of practice uh, uh, to how to do something, and we learned a lot about how to do it better. And the main message for me was uh, there's not enough really good public discourse about this in lots and lots of different countries, uh, and it's probably the time to do it or to help organize it or to create conditions so it can emerge and stuff like that. Thank you. Thank you, Hank. Um, as part of this call, I'm, I'm kind of thinking of asking the group, what are potential questions we could address? For example, um, Tom, thank you for the links to Consensus Conference. I was going to go do some research after the call. Now I have to do less of that. Um, and so one of the questions that I think comes naturally from what you just reported back is what would help young people run with this and fix the world? Uh, to be a little optimistic about the question. Um, and I, I, that's a question I would love to address because I think young folks are like uh, on it. There's a bunch of really alarmed and activated and smart young people around the world. A totally different question is one that Gil asked on the OGM list, which was like, hey, how do we present, prevent uh, November 2024 from being a MAGA runaway? And how do we like stop that train from from either flying off the rails or coming into the station, whichever train you think it is. Um, and that's an interesting question as well. Although my instincts are that there's things that are fundamentally broken that aren't that amenable to tactics in the, in the, in the short term. I don't know. Uh, but I think that's a super interesting question. And I'm curious what other questions that we might talk about are in your brains as in Ken. 
So I just, I'm going to put a link to um, the Plex that came out today because it's got Gil's uh, wonderful uh, contribution where he asked ChatGPT, what would happen if we placed well-being of the living world at the center of everything? And you can go in there and read that. It's really quite remarkable. Um, and I think, personally, I think focusing on the questions of what's broken and how do we fix it is not the right approach because it's that's not going to get us where we need to go. But focusing on the question of what if we attend to the well-being of every system at every level for all living beings in the entire planet, that would be a different organizing principle and a different organizing paradigm for influencing how we would uh, design governance structures. And thank you, Gil, for doing that. It's a tremendous public service. Um, thanks, Ken. Credit where credit is due. This got started by an article from Andrew Winston, uh, author of Net Positive, together with Paul Palm, former Unilever CEO, who's an interesting cat. Um, and um, uh, Andrew asked ChatGPT for, uh, I forget the exact prompt, but the narrative of the current world and got that, and then said, what if you centered human well-being? Uh, which produced a very interesting response. Um, and I thought that was not uh, focused enough. So I said, uh, well-being is a living world. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a fascinating thing for a lot of different reasons. Um, um, uh, I, I both agree and disagree. Can I agree that that, that narrative uh, is fundamental um, and um, uh, to animate human spirit and imagination um, to have us thinking about the things that are working. Part of my MO, I guess we call these theories of change these days, for a long time has been to, to highlight um, examples of things that are working, things that are good, things that call to people ac across political divisions to combat the, oh shit, nothing's working narrative that we are peddled all the time, to say here are like you know, millions of examples of creative human endeavor that are inspiring. Uh, and inviting and seductive and call us in to do more like that. So yeah, yes, 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 and all that. Um, and on the November question, um, I would like us to have the operating space after January 2025 to do the kind of things we're talking about. It's not tactics to the exclusion of all that. Uh, but um, my interpretation is that we're in a very serious self-defense situation here. Um, um, and there are times when this is really tricky stuff. There are times when you have to drop everything and take care of an emergency. If you do that all the time, you're truly fucked in other ways. And even the even the firefighters who you know who are doing like 18 hour days fighting California wildfires, when they end their day, they actually clean up their equipment and put it away. So there's a kind of taking care even in the face of emergency that has to happen. The metaphor that keeps coming to me on the um, um, I don't know. I don't know Jerry, if you want to call this tactics or strategy or break it down that way. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm, you know, if 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 I'm hiking on a trail and I find somebody who has fallen and broken their leg and they're bleeding out their thigh, mm. I'm going to tourniquet them. That doesn't build their long-term health. It's not the strategy for you know repairing the trail or doing you know doing all sorts of other things, but. If I don't take urgent action in that circumstance, they will die. That's a different kind of conversation than the kind of conversation we usually have. And it's feeling to me like we are in that kind of historic moment. Um, historical moments are usually named, you know, a century or several centuries later by somebody looking retrospectively and saying, oh, that time then was a historical moment. I don't know if people back then felt like they were living in one. Uh, but I feel like we're living in one. Uh, and so that's very challenging in terms of how to, mm -hmm. how to context and frame the actions. So, thanks, Gil. Uh, Dave. Yeah, I think, thanks, Hank. I was thinking that actually one of the fun exercises that I would probably enjoy is kind of how would we design that conference? Kind of, you know, like what would we, how would we do it? What would it look like? Because I feel like the kind of the facilitation and the the vessel holding is one of those things that you guys have a lot of skills at. Um, and I was I was struck by the idea. I do think that the back casting part is is really a great opportunity. And so Gil kind of positing what what is the future world that we're looking for that we want to achieve, you know, and like how do we get there as opposed to the broken the world's broken out, we fix it framing. Dave, could I just jump in for a second? Um that's not back casting. That's planning toward an inspired goal. What back casting is, which is what the natural step used and what NASA used in the Apollo mission 
is to stand in that future as though it had actually happened. And then ask what happened in the last interval, the last year, the last five years, the last 10 years, what happened in the interval before that, and work your way back to now. Um, I learned this as a little kid when I was trying to solve mazes in newspapers, when there were mazes, in when there were newspapers, um, and found that you could often find a different solution starting from the end than starting from the beginning. Standing here now looking at both infinite possibility and obvious obstacles, it's hard to see a path. Uh, and a pat the path becomes more apparent when you stand in the imagined success and ask, how did we get here? It's a very different mood that's generated. Yeah, thanks. That's a really helpful distinction. And I, I don't, I hadn't made it. Yeah. And, I, and it, make, it, re it really resonates with, you know, like my life only makes sense if I look at it backwards. You know, yeah, I never yeah. would have predicted where I am today, you know, mm -hmm. trying to. And, and it's a really important one, Dave, because lots of people talk about back, back casting and, and mostly they mean planning. And they're, uh -huh. just different, they're just different things. They're both they're both relevant. They're just different. Great, yeah. And so, like, and Fishkin's been doing this really cool. I think it's backcasting stuff using ChatGPT, kind of where he has a series of questions about like what academic what academic uh, specialties were developed that you know, and they end up with a whole new set of college departments and things that existed because of this and things. Um, but anyway, so where I was going with this is is, is partly is a, a conversations I had like the other day where people were saying, you know, how the, we're talking about the good old days and they meant the 90s. And I was thinking, wow, 90s is the good old days, huh? And 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 and, and versus today, which were not good. Today's bad, 90s were good. And, and I was trying to figure out what, what that translated to. And my interpretation was, and I, this is the way I remember the 90s, is the 90s were optimistic. We In the 90s, when the wall was coming down, when apartheid was ending, right? The economy was up. There was this hope, right? So in the 90s, we had a vision of the future, which was optimistic. And somehow today, when we have a whole bunch of stuff, the world's really fucking good, I think, our vision of the future is bad. And so I kind of think that this, a lot of what we mean by, you know, MAGA is going back to a time when the vision of the future was good. Um, and it's, anyway, so I, I, I felt like, and I, and I feel like a lot of the conversations were, were kind of fighting the last war, Right, we're gonna have really good trenches in France and stuff, um, and and we haven't really internalized what's changed, so that we need to, you know, what is it that we're evolving that we need to adjust to? And I would argue things like, you know, bioregional regeneration are, are things that we need to evolve to, and also, like, I mean, it was interesting, Hank, to hear you say they talked about AI. And what was the other shiny thing that was uh, kind of coming in the future that we should focus on? Yeah, climate change. Climate change is two things. And those are both, you know, important, but I don't, compared to things like uh, global literacy rates or kind of the impending population dynamics, or, I mean, you know, there's much more fundamental economic growth in Southeast Asia. I mean, I kind of feel like the, we picked the shiny things for, especially the Western world, and probably have missed a bunch of really other fundamental changes that are underway. It'd be interesting to go back and look at kind of, well, what are the fundamental changes we should be thinking about? Um, to to do the to do the back casting or forward planning, whichever one it is. But uh, anyway, that's really interesting stuff. So this this I'll just note that this thing that we're chewing on is definitely a uh, wicked problem or a hyper object or both of the above and more, because we have already sort of six different thing six different expressions about what's an important thing to tackle, and how do we how do we approach the animal? So. Um, any other questions we could answer uh, approaches to, to state here that you'd like to get on the table? I, I just, I, I posted this GeoGM list and uh, I just posted it here. This is a lecture by Amitav Ghosh, who's a, an amazing writer, Indian um, novelist who has written a couple of uh, nonfiction books, The Nutmeg's Curse and uh, The Great Derangement. Um, he delivered a lecture at, at Cambridge last month and uh, talking about, you know, how we have a handful of people with more power than has ever been held by anyone. These guys, Zuckerberg and Musk, the, their influence over the media, over what people think through social media is unmatched in history. And they have a vision of the world that is, we're going to stockpile and live behind like, closed gates till the apocalypse comes. They call it the event. And we're going to survive. And, and it's like, 
this is an enormously powerful narrative that's out there being propagated by people who do not have the interests of the greater good at heart. Um, you know, and Rushkoff's done a good job of taking them down. You know, what are you going to do with your Navy SEALs who, once there's no money, why would they protect you anymore? Why wouldn't they take over your food supplies, you know? And um, it's just, it's really worth pondering. And the fact that he's from outside of what he calls the Anglosphere, he offers a very different perspective on things. I find it incredibly informative. And so that it's one of those questions that, that you know, we've got power dynamics that are unique in history of, of human beings, as far as I can tell, you know, yes, yeah, there's a lot of ways in which this is the same old, same old, but there's some really new novel emerging things here in terms of when you have a Zuckerberg in charge of Facebook, who can influence billions of people. Um, how do you handle it? What's, what's the governance structure to, to rein in that power? And um, so it just, I have no answer, but it's a question that needs to be on the table. What I said on the panel I was on a couple of days ago was face, Facebook is the largest country on earth. The monthly average users of Facebook are larger than the populations of India and China combined. And it's run by a princeling who has no adult supervision. Mm -hmm. um, and we just kind of like, well, okay, that's fine. That's just that's just free enterprise. And, 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 and who's designed his governance system to keep his investors out of having any oversight of him. Right, right. Um, Tom, please go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, you're, you're putting, does anybody have questions that we could answer here i go well all the questions i have can't be answered easily <laughs> i don't even know if but they don't have to they don't have to be easily answered, answered. Um, they, i don't think i don't even know if the question answer mode it's like yeah. questioning the problem solving mode questioning the question and answer mode the to what extent are the questions wake up questions to live into what some people call strategic questions uh, the, the the best example of a strategic question is why does the emperor have no clothes on? <laughs> Answering the question is totally beside the point. <laughs> uh, but there's uh, one of the things that I, I put a long link. I don't know if it works. It's from my um, from my own feed. Uh, but in the New York Times today, there's a discussion of why is Trump meeting with Urban from Hungary. Mm -hmm. uh, and it describes the the um, authoritarian arrangement in Hungary is wildly different from what's in uh, Russia and most of these other places that he runs it primarily by information control. He doesn't put people in prison or shoot them. <clears throat> he just has the population. He studied how to do this and does this really well. Mm -hmm. And the fact that um, Trump was meeting with um, what's his name from X, uh, Elon. Elon Musk. Yeah, yeah, with Musk, who has tremendous information control power, uh, and that playing and Trump, of course, loves <laughs> loves uh, Putin as well. But the sense of what we may have to pay lots more attention to a lot of focus on Trump replacing hundreds of people as soon as he gets into office on his first day which is itself a big deal. But his ability to move people uh, in without having much facts and without having much information control compared to what he could have if he had allies in the mass media uh, and control of the government, that sort of thing is something what What's the I, I keep going? What's the Aikido move? You know, there's no we don't have anything remotely like the power, either financial power, political power, you know, whatever. It's like, what is the unexpected thing to intervene that would shift the butterfly flap, whatever that would potentially shift things? That that's where my mind goes, and that's in the context of the the fact that I'm not sure anything works. This is a manifestation of such larger dynamics have been going on so long that's a whole other inquiry which is related to the overshoot book that i put in the chat and the uh, schmockenberger and the you know things like that uh that i'd like to explore sometime but these are gigantic okay. questions and once i confront them it's like i don't even know what my work's about anymore and it's that level of of challenge so check um 
Thanks, Tom. I just want to throw in a really quick fantasy of mine uh, before going to Stacy and Hank, which is that um, I keep looking for what Milton Erickson would have done uh, for society. And Milton Erickson was a, a therapist and hypnotist who tried to talk to people's unconscious and change their repertory of behaviors. And he was known for his handshake induction because when you go to shake somebody's hand, you kind of enter a loop. Your 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 body dis your mind disconnects from what you're doing. And he would linger in the hand in the handshake. And by the time he ended the handshake, the person the subject was in a trance. Um, and I'm wondering what are, what are the things what what is the the and I think that we are in a trance very much. Like like if you study modern media and how it operates, we're we're sort of in a constant trance of sorts. And I'm wondering what are the things to do to break the trance that we're in and shift us back to seeing each other again as, as humans and to seeing the earth as uh, sacred in some way, et cetera, et cetera. And going back to the, the well-being of all, all, all critters uh, at all levels would be great. Uh, but, but that's not a logical door to enter. That's a, some, some, there's some other way to enter that door, I think. Anyway, so I have this fantasy that somebody's going to figure out what that magic phrase is and that will go viral like the ice bucket challenge. And all of a sudden, we can all start pulling on the rope in the same direction for, for a change. Um, Stacey, please. Yeah, so I think breaking the trance is going to have something to do with what Hank's talking about wanting to do. And we discussed on the call earlier about different types of people. And I think that plays plays into who needs to be in these conversations. But I want to say something that's really scary and I saved it for this call, not to discuss it, but I think there's something you all should know. Um, so some of you may not know, or I'm sure you don't know, I try to get a feel of what's happening in the different YouTube worlds from different audiences. And there's two trends that are really scary to me. One has to do with the commercials that are being inserted to the different programs that are there that are pitting minorities against immigrants. So that's a real, that scares me because that's really riling the anger. But an even scarier thing, because we talked about on the other called an open-minded kind of way of being and a closed-minded kind of way of being. And I think it's important to realize that people that fall into conspiracies have a good open-minded part, except sometimes it gets diverted. Well, I've noticed that there are a number, a growing number of psychics that are putting out political videos. And I find that very scary. Um, back in 2016, because I had a good girlfriend who pushed me, oh, you have to meet with this one psychic. I went and I did it and it was free. And she had some gift, like we all have some intuition but she started talking to me about Trump. So I started speaking to her in the spiritual language that I'm capable of speaking of in. And I realized that she was just not legitimate. And again, creating a perception to these people that are looking and listening to what the future is gonna look like is a really big problem because it's all about perception. So I just wanted to share that here. Um, Stacey, thank you. I hadn't heard about that at all. And part of part of my impression here is that the vectors for change are unusual and different from what we think they are. They're not logic and debate or any or something like that. They are religious, they are games, they are, you know, et cetera, et cetera. If I could just add one Please. thing, that's why it's so important that we find a way to have conversational spaces that are drawing from all the different sectors like all different kinds of people. How would I, you know, like you guys wouldn't know what I just told you, because I'm sure not most, you know, you don't have too many people in your circles that are sitting looking to see what the different YouTube groups are listening to. You know, we, we really need to have those kinds of spaces. Thanks, Asa. Thank you. Right, go ahead. Okay. Well, I just uh, putting in the chat, uh, some things I want to add. I, uh, what I haven't put in the chat relates to Jerry, you're, you're talking about wake up from the trance. And uh, I, in my own way of talking about it, always call it uh, sleepwalking. So how do you awake uh, and see that you've been walking in your sleep all the time? 
And I do think there are magic words. Uh, and that's the sort of what I mean when I say, what I put in the chat is what stories do we tell ourselves and what stories do we tell each other? Because those stories build up into our entire perception of what's right and wrong and good and bad in the world. And what are those stories which should be told to young people and old people and people from all walks of life? And I put all walks of life in uh, in, in uh, quotation marks because we're all walking through life, some wide awake or party awake or sleepwalking, and we're all on some kind of path. And we don't know if it's our path. We don't know where it's going, but we are still taking that path. And uh, I would also recommend uh, retelling the story from the last call. It was Gil's story, which Jerry retold about the, the drunken and abusive man in the subway and how there were magic words that could be said to him to make that situation uh, uh, more... Uh, uh, to, to defuse a potentially bad situation. And to that extent, I think there are words that young people can say to each other and old people can say to each other and old and young can exchange. And I think it's up to people like us who are conscious of that to try to find them and to get people to prototype stories and... Uh, yeah, well, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thanks, Hank. Um, and just for Tom uh, and Dave, who I think weren't on the last call, this is Terry Dobson on Aikido Sensei's story about being on a subway and having an angry man he wanted to neutralize with Aikido get neutralized by a, 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 an old man in the back of the train who said, hey, what you been drinking? And the guy was like, sake. Uh, my, my wife and I really like drinking sake. And by the end of the ride, uh, the angry guy, angry, dangerous looking guy is crying on his shoulder. There's uh, a great there's a great uh, little YouTube clip from a, um, um, a martial arts master. I think it's a Krav Maga guy, which is not known for its gentleness as a technique. Yeah. And he presents a half a dozen situations of where you could get into a real fight. And the first one I remember is like, you know, he's, you're in a bar and somebody says, you looking at me? And he says, yeah, that shirt's really interesting. I got a shirt like that back at home. <laughs> or you looking at my girl? Yeah, is her name Marilyn? Sure. I had knew somebody named Marilyn. Just like, you know, boom, just uh, both both diverting the energy and engaging with the person at the same time. Really fascinating. I, mm -hmm. I'll I'll see if I can find the clip. There must be strategic parallels to that for the mass situation well, that's that's the invitation is well, how do we find those and you know it, it i mean i'd love to hear you say more about that tom because in you know if a guy gets in my face in a bar it's very the this is the conversation it's right here if it's if it's me and the world of america now where where are the places of engagement how does the engagement happen how does that metaphor translate mm -hmm. oh into this really I, I don't know but you got thoughts Tom <clears throat> well I I would lead it it would go in in a variety of different directions it's not a clear line of inquiry yeah. sort yeah. of an open-ended inquiry and I know David had something I don't know if people want to want to explore there with all the stops and wonders and hmms that we'll we'll get as we explore that so for the time being I'll have David do say his piece Oh, okay, Tom, thanks. Well, I mean, I guess I was just struck by, I, mean, I was coming back to the problem framing and feeling like one of the problems with the problem framing is that it looks back and we're in a future, you know? And and so the fact that we have a different media structure, I don't know if it's good or bad, it's different though, right? So we could wish we could go back to Walter Cronkite, but <laughs> we're not. So we have Mr. Beast instead, you know? And what's it mean to have Mr. Beast, you know? Um, and I don't know how influential Zuckerberg is. I mean, if he told everybody to do something, would they? I mean, Taylor Swift, can she really get people to vote? I don't know. Um, don't think so. <laughs> Some, maybe. Maybe enough. 
but you know, we're actually when we talk about a lot of these things, it really is the margin, right? It's the three or four percent at the edge that we really care about, um, including the vote in in November, right? Um, so, so I guess you know, we we talk a lot about democracy and the governance calls, and I'm kind of like, yes, got, democracy was a really interesting technology that we designed a couple hundred years ago, and it's it's still useful, and then we're evolving it, and it's good, and. You know, California just went through another jungle primary. And there's all kinds of weird things that come out of it and stuff like that. So we can keep playing with democracy, but we're in a future that has that's very different. And what kinds of new technology are we going to require that I think have principles like people get to have autonomy, you know, and they, they get responsibility. We're not going to have Orban making the decisions for us. There's still going to be, you know, the masses get to participate in decision making, but we need new technologies for that. Um, and so what do those technologies look like is kind of the, the, for the situation that you're in, you know, you're not fixing the problem that was broken and trying to go back, but we're trying to um, move forward into the new space that we're in. And, and one of the observations I've had is that, you know, thinking about Robert Putnam in the uh, Bowling Alone book, and then, you know, this notion that, oh my God, society's losing its tensile strength because people don't join together anymore. Um, and we don't go bowling and we don't join the Elks Club. And it's like, both things are true. Right, so is the fix to go back and get a bunch of people to join the Elks Club and go bowling? Or is it to like start to have a bunch of organizations like Jerry who just convene people on, on Zoom and then they have conversations and they have community and they build trust, you know, and you have lots and lots and lots of these happening around the world in all kinds of different languages crossing all kinds of networks. You know, is that better or worse than bowling apps? I don't know, um, but it's different and that's the state we're in. Right? I feel like we're, you know, we're kind of like not giving ourselves credit but yeah, really, like we don't get the bowling part. So Jerry, maybe you could get organized more bowling as, as a set of part of these. We could really have it all. But anyway, I just feel like we're, you know, we're we are adapting to this modern future and and we're creating it and it's good, you know, and and um and Dave, a piece of what you said took takes me back to why I sort of started these calls, which was I will really wanted to know what's working. Uh, and and help make it easy to propagate what's working so that people any place can sort of pick up things that seem to work really well and replicate them in their community. And when uh, when I found a house in West Philly for my second year in grad school, I recruited a couple buddies to join me in the house the next year, one of whom had had a great household at the University of York, and he brought in a couple of house governing rules that we all adopted very happily. And they worked really well for our whole year, and they were different from the usual way you would sort of divide up tasks or, or whatever else. And that's that's the kind of contagion that I'd love to find and share. And uh, Tom and his co-intelligence colleagues have developed the wise democracy pattern language. Uh, there's also liberating structures and a couple other things in the group works deck nearby, all of which have wisdom in them, distilled wisdom, lovely deglazed wisdom from a lot of people who cared, uh, and few of which are getting the play that I think they could get if we figured out ways of getting them to be more contagious, more easily adopted, more whatever that is. And I, I, I'm interested in that in that process because I think that a, if people can up their game in how we converse with one another and how we approach one another, uh, some of these problems will start to melt because a lot of the fear is built up from uh, alienation and uh, in, in, you know intentionally provoked fear. And once, once I'm afraid of you, I'm just not going to listen to anything you have to say. In fact, I will often take the opposite stance just on principle or because my tribe says so or whatever. Then, And we need to melt the tribalism. We need to melt the fear. We need to melt a lot of those things so that we can get back into um, co-intelligence. And I, I just got to stick in like, you know, eight years ago when I was like arguing that the one thing that we really needed to do was to have the destruction of the GOP. It, it was the problem and we had to break it down and get rid of it, replace it with a new party. It's like, be very careful what you wish for. In the world. <laughs> that's, that's your, it's your fault. <laughs> your fault. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gil and Tom also, if you want to jump in and talk about sort of where, where you've been with all this. But let, yeah, let's start with Gil for a sec. Gil is actually Jane in this case. <laughs> oh, great. Hi, Jane. Yay. Um, uh, as I was listening, um, a question came to me, which um, I consider myself a womanist, not a feminist. Um, 
And I wonder what conversation this group would be having if the Republican and far right religious agenda was focused on tying men's tubes and denying them reproductive rights. Oh yeah. Be really different real quick. Because there's a level of of existential desperation in women that I think is unperceived even still. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. I think, uh, well, I think that the right, the far right is extremely good at lighting hot fires and blowing a lot of oxygen on stupid ass issues to distract us from really important issues that are actually on the table, like women's rights. Um, and I, part of me wants to know, how do you disable that? How do you neutralize that? Because, I, you know, uh, critical race theory and whether trans kids should have separate bathrooms. There's a lot of oxygen, a lot of oxygen been blown on those two issues very intentionally. Because if you're screaming about this over here, who's going to pay attention to that big thing that we're, you know, slipping through the back door over there? Um, and that scares me a lot. And I, I think that that's, it's doable. Go ahead, Stacey. But the right did something very smart that we don't do. So when it came to the issue of abortion, the Republican women that I spoke to bought into the story, which was totally <laughs> fake, that it was only about states' rights versus federal rights. So again, they're, <laughs> they're more devious. What can I say? They're more devious and manipulative. But we could be smarter about changing the conversations. It, it should be clear by now that the states' rights story has been bullshit from the beginning. The Republicans are in favor of states' rights when it serves their purposes, and they're opposed to states' rights when it serves their purposes. And the Supremes have made that abundantly clear. For sure. The other thing about the about the abortion story is that it's a it's it's a marvelous story of framing. Um, because when they claim the label pro life. It implicitly made everybody else anti-life. And instead of refuting the framing, the dem the left moved into this pro-life versus pro-choice thing. And, you know, I'm for abortion rights and I'm pro-life. Not in the sense that the Republicans are pro-life, but I I'm I'm just like my stance in the world is pro-life and pro-choice. And um um what's his name? Um the, the Cal guy, the, the framing guy, and whatever his name was. You know, uh, the, from Lakoff. Lakoff, thank you. Sorry. Lakoff is, le is the left one. From is the right one. The, the, the one who did pro life and all that is David Frum. No, no, no. It was before oh. that. Uh, it was before that. It was no, the other there, guy. There is, a, there is a guy on the right. I can't think of his name who's. I can does, see him. Does all that language stuff yes. about, you know, but, but, but it's I don't like, think it's like, from. Like, from was a speechwriter for. Um, yeah. his name you're, you're right. It's not from. It's. Uh, yeah, it's a Frank, Frank Luntz. My Luntz. Luntz. Yeah, there we go. I always who confuse been, the two. Who has been generous with his advice to the Democrats too, but they don't take it. Yeah. And one of the things that Luntz and Crowd demonstrated is that if you if you can if you can inject a powerful frame, you basically own the stage, and all the debate happens within your frame. And in that game, you've lost before you've started. Well, the the frame is really it. it, it this is really about life loving. Yeah. And and lovable futures. A, a livable future may be a very miserable one, but it may be liver, livable because human beings tolerate an enormous amount of suffering before they take up war. So it's really, it's about a lovable future. Thanks, Jane. Uh, Tom, you've had your hand up for a while. Like the, the Republican, the junk tank and think tank people are studying night and day how to dismantle our voting system. And that's the 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 destruction of reproductive rights and the destruction of voting system and voting rights. This is just this is the Tyrannosaurus Rex that we're facing. It is. It's awful. I I completely agree. Um, Tom, you've had your hand up for a while. Also, I would just love your reflections on what got you into what you've done for many years now and what you wish would happen. 
<clears throat> again, so complex. Seems like <laughs> seems like an easy thing to answer. Uh, what I was going to say in this was that the whole framing thing <clears throat> is a subset of story uh, and the power of story and the extent to which narrative structures are how we perceive reality and function in reality. When you look at you know quantum and, and you know quantum science and stuff like that, it's like what what's around us is not this stuff. It's fields of probability kind of, and we have constructed as any species constructs a particular way of seeing the world that will allow us to function as human, as bodies. Uh, that's how we're evolved. And there's so much else going on. Uh, and we create stories that work for us and battered kids and unemployed people and people who are rich and you know, everybody creates stories that then they live into. And the framing is, is functioning at a, story level uh and one of my big inquiries i i get a a sense that you can talk about a story field that there's actually mm. a field like an elect like a magnetic field all well, of iron filings line up you know and the, the story of the american way of life which i call a wall <laughs> the american way of life has a uh, is a narrative structure it has lots of different parts to it and people you have to relate to it. You have to either follow it or battle it, all of which support it. Uh, Here's a gentleman named Tom Atley who ran the Story Field Conference with Peggy Holman in 2007. Right. So that's how you remember it. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah, so that there's, and that conference, I was the only person who was upset at that conference. I actually cried at the end of it in the little talk that's online. Uh, but this, the sense that people came to the conference to find out better ways of doing their particular kind of story work. And I wanted to shift into how can we do, uh, how can we think together about how to intervene at the level of narrative in the culture so that there is a different field, a different narrative field that we are presenting that other people really that's like imagineering is one of the things I put. You, you write a story or create a story of some kind that appeals to people and that gives them everything they need to live it. You know, mm. like the monkey wrench gang did that for Earth first. Right. You want to you want to put the monkey wrench in the people who are fucking with your environment. Read read the book. It tells you how to put the syrup in the earth moving equipment you know, and block it up. You know, it's like so having those kinds of stories. Uh, and there've been that's been manifested on both sides. You know, there's right wing stories that have had the power for people to just move. But that inquiry about how do we intervene, particularly when we're not in control of massive amounts of media, is there some way to use virality and narrative strategically and with a lot of knowledge? That's one point of intervention. But I have to admit, but when you say how I got here and what I think needs to be done. I don't know what needs to be done. I have lots of inquiries and I have a deep sense from the re references I put earlier that all the ideas I've ever had are nowhere remotely near handling the challenges we face. So uh, the level of mystery that I'm working on right now is gigantic. I'm doing a book on co-intelligence, but that's just because this guy who's promoting AI, using AI in, in your life and work, has a book coming out called Co-Intelligence. <laughs> He's about to colonize the intellectual space <laughs> I've been working on for 30 years. And now I have to get a book out that has that title to oh, wow. counter it. But I don't really believe the stuff in the book is gonna handle it. If we made it through the eye of the needle, some of this stuff would be part of it. Wow. But it's not, okay, here's the solution. It's nothing remotely like that in my own mind. Uh, so it goes on and on and on. And all my work arose out of the Great Peace March in 1986. 400 people walking across the country for nine months with nobody in charge. Yeah. Uh, and that's a whole fascinating story in itself. And that gave me a, an insight into there's a radically different way to you know, function in the world than our usual ways. And my inquiries, uh, inquiries into that generated all this stuff. But as you can sense, there's tons of other stuff to talk about behind all that. And I don't want to colonize our brief time. Check. Um, thanks, Tom. And I'd like to end our call at the top of the hour because I was—I sort of promised these would be one-hour calls, but we, we're, we're kind of just going. 
um, Hank then Gill. And that's yeah, th it was a pattern anyway. Uh, right? <laughs> yeah, thanks, uh, Tom, for talking about it the way you, you do. And I wasn't actually familiar with the uh, wise democracy patterning language, but I'll look into that uh, uh, later today and tomorrow. And I'd like to sort of hopefully build on what you were just saying and referring to Stacy and Stacy's uh, uh, journey for exploring what other people uh, are thinking like and what words and stories they use. My big question is, do we really know what kind of uh, stories and books and pop lyrics and comic books and films are actually changing the way young people see see the world, uh, shifting their consciousness. Uh, I mean, I don't, and I don't know if, you know, where there's a source of that. But I think what's very important is if we want to make kind of intervention someplace, uh, one thing that's really important is to uh, to know about what's influencing uh, teenagers and preteens, uh, because those are the people who will have to take over the world tomorrow. Thanks, Hank. I put some of the story, the major storytellers in the chat. Thank you, uh -huh. Gil. Um, I've I've got to pop for another call, but real quickly, um, I I love where we've gone. Um, I like Tom. I like your question about how we use virality. Um, uh, it's not only done by people who have power and money. Uh, and the story of the, you know, the 700 Club and the Christian right is a great example of something that seemingly came out of nowhere. I had a window into it in the early, what, 80s, I guess, uh, when it was young. And um, um, so, you know, things are possible here. And just look at good Lord Taylor Swift, who just told 282 million followers to vote. Um um, you know, there have been cultural shifts over my lifetime that have happened in various ways, some centrally driven, some virally driven. Uh, it strikes me that one of the challenges we have, and um, Tom, I wonder if there's any way you can stop this guy from seizing your space. Uh, but we, uh, the gen before Ken busts me on the we, the general we that we keep talking about here are not primarily oriented around power and wealth. And we're dealing with people who are primarily oriented around power and wealth. Uh, and um, we play differently because of that. And it's good and bad. It's like it's advantageous and limiting in various kinds of ways. And it's something worth us talking about. And it's, you know, the, the subway story is one lovely analog of that. Um, but that's, you know, that, 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 that's one of many stories we, we could tell and need to tell. Check. Gil, is Jane still there? Yeah. So I just want to end with a, a little very quick anecdote. Gil and I are both part of a, a study group for some uh, an ontological coaching book series. And there's a woman in this group who teaches at the University of Oklahoma, Oklahoma, Heartland, right? And she relayed to us in the group, she said, the young women on campus are outraged and they are totally organizing and voting and getting the word out. So just a little glimpse of, yeah, you know, it's not an answer, but young women are especially incensed by what's going on and they are mobilizing and acting and organizing. So a little glimmer of hope. So when I asked the question at the top of the call, how do we help young people run with it? That's a piece of what I mean. Yeah. That's yeah, a piece of what I mean right there. Ask, you often ask, how do we get more young people onto our calls? Maybe that's the wrong question. I think that is the wrong question. Yeah, I mean, going on <clears> there. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do we help them get this done? Good. I so have thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. I'll see you next week, same time. If anybody wants to figure out where and how we help young folks do this, bring that information back with you next Thursday. Mm -hmm. When we rejoin our merry band, on TikTok, its, right? On its yeah, TikTok. Is exactly. that all the young people are these days? <laughs> I can totally see you mastering TikTok, Dave. Jane says surrender to their help. We have ways to make you TikTok. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> On that the note, is ticking. Uh, it certainly is. <laughs> Thanks, all. Bye-bye.